Good morning, everyone. We'd like to uh, begin our winter offsite meeting. We'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to extend my congratulations to our two newest board members, David Miller and Margaret Brown, both of whom are representing our at-large members for the next four years, and this is their first indoctrination. So welcome to both of you. Uh, I'm glad to see you here bright and early. We appreciate your call to serve our 1.9 million members and confident that you'll do all you can to represent their interests moving forward. Uh, we also want to welcome our representatives, the member and employer associations joining us here today, as well as to, our, to, as, well as to the members of the public who have made the trip to Petaluma for this meeting. We appreciate your active involvement and your important partners, and we welcome your feedback. Offsite meetings give us a chance to learn and strategize. They also encourage open and candid dialogue, which helps to broaden our perspectives. We know how important it is for board members to have diverse perspectives. It help us, uh, helps us to enrich the quality of information gathering and our decision-making process. As we advocate for those board qualities and the companies we invest in, I'm proud that we can serve as a best practice leader in the way we conduct our own business. All sessions in this ballroom are being video videotaped and will be available on our website later this week. In a minute, I'll be introducing our Chief Executive Officer, Marcy Frost, who will give us some remarks about our agenda for the next few days. But before we hear from Marcy, I want to take a moment of personal privilege. <coughs> I want to thank the board and say that it's been my pleasure to serve as board president for the past 13 years. We've seen a lot of changes over those 13 years, and most of them are for the better. And I thank you for helping us along with this journey and uh, the journey we're going to continue because this, uh, this is a very important plan and fund, and we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can for our members on a daily basis. So I encourage all of us to uh, be stalwart in our representation of our members. I look forward to continuing to serve rep and represent school employees on this board. I'm certainly very passionate about the school members of this system, and I am going to continue to fight hard on their behalf. Now to talk about a little more of the detail on what's ahead of us, I'd like to welcome our CEO to make our opening remarks. Marcy. Thanks, Rob, and good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the executive team and everyone either here from CalPERS or back in the offices at CalPERS, uh, we also want to welcome our new board members um, to their first offsite, and we're looking forward to working with you both in the years ahead. Uh, starting off the new calendar year, and I think with this offsite in particular, it gives us an opportunity, as Rob indicated, to be able to think about fresh ideas about how we run the system, how we make the system much more sustainable. So we're looking forward to some very thoughtful discussions over the next three days. Much of our work now that we've finished asset allocation and we've set in the actuarial assumptions, much of our work over the next 12 months will focus on continuing to strengthen the fund. Uh, the fund being at 68% of the necessary assets no, and understanding that that's a point in time uh, does cause a lot of concern from our members' viewpoint as well as our employers' viewpoint. And we spend uh, much time going out and explaining uh, the, the information and the data to the people who are most impacted by the choices that uh, this board and our team makes at CalPERS. And so one of the ways that we'll do that is through long-term uh, return-oriented investment strategies that focus on sustainability of the fund and looking at risks associated with uh, ESG. Ted and his team will start the morning off with a review of the five-year ESG strategic plan and our recent experience for implementing one of the initiatives, uh, Divya will be uh, leading us through a, a very successful outcome of one of the initiatives. The policies in this plan provide us a platform to engage with companies to ensure the best return possible is achieved on our investments. That will be followed by a presentation on what sustainable investment goals mean to the global investment community. And we're honored to have the Assistant Secretary General uh, Elliot Harris on our panel this morning. Um, Elliot also leads the uh, New York office for the uh, United Nations. And then we'll finish the morning sessions with a discussion of our role with PRI, the Principles for Responsible Investment, including a look at the business plan over the next 10 years. And then after lunch, Ted's team will wrap up our sustainable investing discussion and then bring in fellow investment professionals <coughs> to guide us through a discussion about the impact of constant um, evolving and disrupting technology on the financial industry. And then we'll end the day with a review of proposed regulatory changes to our Cal CalPERS um, board election process. And then tomorrow's agenda, we have it teed up to focus on healthcare. 
uh, including a final discussion and a work session on the healthcare beliefs. We also have representatives from NASRA, which is an associa association for state retirement administrators, here to talk about federal legislation, primarily on the pension side, and trends in the pension industry around the United States. And then we'll close out our business on Thursday with uh, fiduciary training. I'd also, before I close my remarks, I'd like to provide you with a brief update on the performance of the Public Employees Retirement Fund as of the end of the year, the calendar year. The total fiscal year-to-date performance is 8.09. The one-year return of the fund is 15.73. The three-year return is 7.58, which is right at the benchmark, and the five-year return is 9.03, slightly above the benchmark. So before I close, I'd also uh, like to thank Rob for his unwavering attention to serving the members. It's been a real pleasure working with Rob in this role as the president in my first year on, on um, joining CalPERS. And I know we'll still have access to Rob in, in another role that uh, we'll, we'll find out soon about. Um, but Rob has been a real pleasure and joy to work with, and the members should feel very proud of having him serve them on this board. Thank you, and that concludes my remarks. Thank you. All right, that brings us to uh, our election time, if we could please uh, call this meeting to order, we'd like to call the roll. Here. 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 Thank you. That brings us to uh, the election of 2018 board president and vice president. I'd like to open the nominations for board president, Ms. Taylor. Yes, I'd like to <coughs> nominate Priya Mother for board president. I think it's time for some uh, fresh ideas and uh, new leadership. And certainly it, in this time of the woman, we certainly need to you know, follow what we preach. It would be uh, an honor to have Ms. Mother as president of the board. And I think it would be um, advantageous for Cal Purs to have a female president of the board. Again, I'd like to nominate Priya Mother. Thank you. Ms. Mother's been nominated. Any other nominations? Mr. Slayton. Yes, I'd like to nominate Henry Jones uh, for president. Henry's done a great job as uh, vice president and uh, I think has uh, earned the trust and respect of the entire board. And I think he'd be a great leader going forward. Very good. Thank you. Any further nominations for the Office of President? Any further nominations for the Office of President? Third and final time. Any further nominations for the Office of President? If none, the nominations for the Office of President are closed. We have two candidates for the Office of President, Ms. Mother and Mr. Jones. Uh, I assume at this point we should probably do a roll call vote. <laughs> he hesitated. <laughs> oh, roll call. Oh, you already, she called Brown? Okay. Yes, Thank you. Ms. Mother. Jones. Ms. Mother. Oh, if I count right, we're at 6-6. Six, six. That was very thoughtful, all of you. <laughs> this is never the place we want to be. Um, however, at this point in time, I'm going to cast my vote for Ms. Mother. Um, I'll leave it at that. I think that it's unfortunate that we got to this point, but either candidate would be great choices. So I certainly uh, thank everyone for putting their names in, uh, but I will cast my vote for Ms. Mother, which now makes Ms. Mother the incoming president of this board. Congratulations. <laughs> and now I will turn the gavel over to her to uh, do the vice president elections. Thank you very much. It is indeed a great honor and privilege to serve as the president of this board. I think this is a tremendous board who has done, which has done really 
really leader, leading things over the past several years um, under the direction of our, our president, our former president, uh, Mr. Fechner, and I'm very proud to be following in his footsteps and honored by the, um, by the confidence that you all have shown in me today, so thank you for that. Uh, let me move to the election of the vice president, and I will now accept nominations. Mr. Lynn. Uh, <clears throat> I don't want Rob to enjoy too much freedom yet, so I'm <laughs> nominating him for vice president of the board. Thank you. The name of Mr. Fechner has been offered a nomination. Ms. Hollinger. Yes, I'd like to nominate. Is your mic, uh, just turn your microphone on. Okay. I'd like to nominate Mr. Jones. The name of Mr. Jones has been offered a nomination. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, uh, oh yes, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the uh, election of the president uh, le leads me to believe that there's a desire to uh, have uh, some change at the top. And uh, while I have uh, worked diligently working with Rob to make a difference in this institution, and I think that uh, given the board's outcome that there's a desire to have some change at the leadership, I will respectfully decline the vice presidency. Thank you, Mr. Jones. So the, na so Mr. the name of Mr. Jones has been withdrawn. The name of Fechner is still in nomination. Are there any further nominations? Sorry, Mr. Jones? Yeah, I'd like to nominate Bill Slayton. Thank you. The name of Mr. Slayton has been offered in nomination. Are there are there any further nominations? The two names that have been nominated are Mr. Slayton and Mr. Fechner. Those are the names before us. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Uh, Mr. Slayton? Fechner? You didn't call me Mr. Fechner. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so congratulations, Mr. Fechner. Thank you. And Vice President of the Board. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us now to um, the next uh, item on our agenda, which is the CalPERS, thank you, Karen, um, ESG Strategic Plan Overview and Climate Action 100 Plus Update. Um, so let's get started with that. Our five-year uh, ESG strategic plan was adopted, I think, uh, three and a half years ago now, and we'll be hearing from our Chief Investment Officer, Ted Eliopoulos. Welcome, Ted. And will you um, introduce your panelists? I'd be delighted to. Uh, good morning, uh, Ms. Mother. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, this. Uh, uh, this first 15 minutes of our, uh, of our agenda, uh, your CalPERS staff will give you a brief 15-minute overview of our uh, strategic plan as well as the setting for today's discussion on ESG. I'm joined by Ann Simpson, uh, head of our sustainability uh, investment uh, team um, here at CalPERS. I think she needs really no introduction to this board for sure, but uh, one, of, uh, one of the leading uh, experts around the globe on sustainable investing. And uh, next to her is Divya Menkakar, also part of our uh, sustainable investment team and one of the principal uh, architects of the climate, what's, what's now called the Climate 100 Plus, which you'll be hearing a little bit more of soon. So with that, um, let me get started uh, with a brief overview of uh, the themes that we'll be covering uh, today and how we'll be covering those themes both by your internal staff as well as some very distinguished external uh, speakers that are coming uh, before us this morning and into the afternoon. Sustainable investment has become a theme of growing uh, interest and importance in the financial marketplace. 
Uh, we've seen uh, this issue expand across the asset owner as well as the asset manager community over the past uh, decade and decades, really. Uh, Bloomberg estimates that some $70 trillion of financial capital is now being invested with some consideration of environmental, social, and governance issues. The moniker we use is ESG. CalPERS has been recognized as a leader in this field, both by our peers and by financial analysts. Uh, the awards and recognition we've received are, cer received are certainly a tremendous uh, honor for the institution and uh, an honor for our investment staff as well, and they mean a great deal to, uh, to all of us. Uh, however, we know we're entering into uh, new territory uh, with ESG. It is a complex area. It's an evolving uh, issue. We want to make sure that we move forward uh, carefully and with due consideration and in a thoughtful, in a thoughtful manner. And as uh, Anne and I remind each other uh, constantly, with humility. We, we want to uh, be sure that we're open to learning along the way from our own experience, from our investment peers and partners, from our stakeholders, and from the research uh, as it develops over time. It's in that spirit that we welcome today's speakers and look forward to a uh, really wonderful and rich dialogue uh, with ourselves, our external speakers, and with you, uh, the board, over this very important topic. Uh, in, uh, in this morning's sessions, we have uh, three themes. Uh, number one, we want to highlight, as you'll see in just a minute here, uh, our own work in the field of sustainable investments. That will be followed by a keynote address from Elliot Harris, as mentioned by, uh, uh, um, by Ms. Frost. I was trying to remember if Mr. Fechner or Ms. Frost. Uh, um, Mr. Harris is the Associate General Secretary at the United Nations, and he will be introducing to this board uh, many for the first time their sustainability, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, a very important and groundbreaking piece of work that the UN has done. Following that presentation, we'll hear from Ophir Brook from the PRI, one of our longstanding partners, who will introduce the PRI's vision, a blueprint for the next 10 years in sustainable investment. In your board books and uh, online, we've provided lots of background materials for you, the board, to set the stage for this discussion and for uh, our external speakers. As uh, this board, I think, is well, uh, well aware, uh, the board, and uh, with staff's input, adopted a strategic plan for sustainable investment, which sets our priorities for our resources and our efforts over the next five years, even though we know that this work will extend well into the decades uh, in, in the long-term future of the fund. <coughs> this plan reflects the investment beliefs that we uh, have all uh, both adopted and brought uh, forward as a key framework for our investment decision making. One of those key investment beliefs posits that long-term value creation is based on the effective management of three forms of ca capital, financial, human, and uh, physical. In that regard, we rely on the companies that we invest in to provide the financial returns that pay for the benefits uh, that have been promised to our pensioners. Our companies that we invest in rely on this financial capital to provide them with the, need, with the funds that they need to grow their businesses. CalPERS provides the financial capital through our investment, both in companies directly in the public markets, through our equity and fixed income portfolios, 
We also invest quite heavily in the private markets, both in private equity and real assets, which include both real estate and infrastructure as well as timberland investments. Now managing this financial capital is uh, definitely the day job uh, of the investment staff uh, here. It's also uh, the core of our mission. Our members and beneficiaries are relying on us achieving the returns year in, year out, and over the decades to come. Focusing on those returns is our fiduciary duty. We need to act with prudence and care to ensure that we can generate the returns which pay the pensions for our hardworking California public employees. On Thursday, the board's fiduciary council, Ashley Dunning, uh, will cover fiduciary duty as an annual topic for the board. Uh, but in addition to that more generalized discussion of uh, the board's fiduciary obligation, she includes a discussion of the legal standard of fiduciary duty, uh, both as it's applied here in California and apropos to our discussion of global topics to, you know, here today, how that standard is defined and evolving uh, throughout the globe. Now, as a team, we are laser focused on our target rate of return, uh, which this board has adjusted recently to 7%, which is a demanding target given today's market environment. It's Im particularly important to focus <coughs> on our investment returns because it is those returns that pay pensions. This is especially so since CalPERS is approximately 68% funded. Uh, we were, as other institutional investors and individual investors, hit hard by the financial crisis, and we're still growing our way back to a fully funded status. As the board's well aware, we have a plan uh, to achieve that over a 30-year period. Uh, but that means we need to achieve a high rate of return and accept a high degree of equity risk over that time horizon. This informs why we have developed a sustainable investment strategy. Our first priority is to protect the fund's financial sustainability over long periods of time. This is how we protect and care for the pensions and benefits of our members. It really is the heart of why we need to consider both the risks and the opportunities that are provided by environmental, social, and governance considerations. We know from our own research and experience that companies need to take care of their human capital in order to perform well. Human capital is how economists think about the role of employees, the impact of supply chains, and more broadly how companies manage their relationships with their own communities in which they operate. We also know that environmental issues can have an impact on company performance. This can be seen in risks that we've <coughs> talked about uh, in our investment committee from time to time that companies can face due to extreme weather, water shortage, uh, and other impacts related to climate change. It also means, uh, it can also mean better performance for those companies with better environmental management, uh, which ultimately saves <coughs> money for those companies. Energy efficiency is a clear example of that, and as we've talked about in our investment committee meetings, uh, energy efficiency programs within our real estate uh, program have helped uh, save, uh, uh, save money and in improve the performance of our real estate portfolio uh, with several iterations over the last 10 years. Now this is a complex and not simple and evolving and challenging set 
of issues that we should approach again with some measure of curiosity and humility. What is evident is that investors are increasingly aware of how their financial capital can be impacted by these uh, issues, both positively and negatively. They are all interconnected. Now, CalPERS spent the best part of the last two years uh, developing a sustainability strategic plan and carefully choosing priorities uh, for your investment staff to follow up on, which we've tried to identify uh, to play to our strengths as a long-term global investor. That strategic plan is now being implemented with uh, much hard work from our entire CalPERS investment team as well as the team across our enterprise, uh, together in partnership with our peer investors and networks in many financial markets across the globe. Uh, with that introdu introduction, let me turn it to Anne uh, to doc talk about highlights of our strategic plan, which will set, uh, set the setting for, uh, for our external guests who will be coming up next. Anne? Um, thank you very much, Ted, and uh, good morning. And congratulations to our new president and uh, continuing vice president, new role. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be here today, and I think extremely important that CalPERS um, is inviting this discussion on the sustainable development goals um, and just taking a moment to see what progress we're making with our sus uh, sustainable investment plan. Um, as Ted said, Divya is actually going to take us through the detail of one of the important um, initiatives that we've launched. Um, but I think my job is just to take a I was going to say a moment and step down memory lane and can we find the next slide? Where, where do you suggest pointing it, Ted? To there the, to go, the heavens. <laughs> ah, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you with a board book or an iPad or the public, you've got papers outside, um, you'll see we have a nice chart. And um, this is sort of reminds me of that uh, comment by Churchill. I said, I'm sorry I, to write you a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. So this is the short letter, which we labored over for many weeks to think we've got this five-year plan with all these dimensions of financial, human, and physical capital. How can we put it all in one place? So you can actually look at one page and see what we're doing. So let me just spend a couple of minutes explaining this lovely chart, which we spent so much time putting together. So you'll see along the top in the green bars, uh, we've said environmental, social, and governance themes. Uh, we, we're using those terms because it's how this topic gets talked about. But as investors, we really do see these as the three forms of capital. Environmental issues, this is physical capital. Social issues, this is human capital. We worry about governance because that's how we protect financial capital. Um, and what we did in the strategic plan process was say, well, knowing this great complexity and evolving nature of the topic, all the possible topics, what are a number of issues where we could be strategic? In other words, CalPERS could say, if you bring the full force, the full commitment of CalPERS onto an issue, could we have impact? Could we generate results that are going to be good for our members and help protect their pensions? So we've come up with um, some issues which um, you'd expect to see. So the top one is data and corporate reporting. Why? Because one of the real challenges we have when we're looking at these issues is finding the information we need to know what the connection is with risk and return. Um, the next is manager expectations. So right across the portfolio for internal and external managers, we've started to build in policies, procedures, due diligence, reporting mechanisms, so that these considerations flow right across the portfolio. So this is no, no small piece of work. This is not inconsiderable, and, and we're a year in. Um, the third, and very much to Ted's point about curiosity, 
we have continued to realize that research is essential. When we're looking at financial issues, we're sitting on top of several hundred years of thinking about accounting and reporting and what companies need to tell us. But on these environmental and social and governance issues, we're really we're in the foothills of a long climb. We're at the beginning. So the research is important. Um, we next um, have picked up um, some topics that are very important for CalPERS. Um, I'm not going to mention the first one. It's climate change. Divya is going to explain what we've been doing there. But climate change was chosen because it's a topic that will affect, we believe, risk and return in our portfolio over the decades to come. In fact, we're already seeing impact. So climate change for us was an issue that whenever, wherever, however, we are deploying long-term capital, we need to start considering um, the risks and the opportunities. The second theme, as you go into the middle, you'll see diversity and inclusion. And again, this is something where we saw in all of our asset classes, in all of our investments, we can benefit from ensuring there's diversity and inclusion because it protects us from groupthink, it makes sure we get the best talent, and as we're entering into these new and complicated, challenging topics, it's even more important that we have a variety of perspectives to help us navigate. We can't just think that the old, uh, the old map is going to help us navigate through these new times. Um, and the final governance issue, very important for CalPERS, is um, alignment of interest, and it's our project on private equity. So um, the core work program continues, proxy voting, corporate engagements, responding to shareholders, engaging with the legislature and regulators. Um, that will continue as it has done for many years. Um, so with that overall framework, that's the ambition. Um, we'll be coming to you in March and giving you a full report on our progress down this path. Oh, excuse me. Um, but given that we have just made um, some very important progress on the climate change agenda, um, we thought it would be good to share what we've been doing with the board. Um, so let me, with that, and turn to Divya. And um, can I just ask a real quick question? Yes, please. I'm so sorry. No. Um, this was great. This is, I really appreciate the overview and what we're doing. The only, as we're looking at research, uh, the middle under social, the only thing I would add, and I don't know if you guys are when you're doing the research are looking at both, but as wealth and income inequality, I assume you are, but it can be if you're not looking at both and the research comes up with a, a policy of some kind and you're not looking at both wealth and income, it could be leaving something out. So I just wanted to make sure that, I sure, I'm sure you are, <laughs> but no, I just wanted to make sure. No, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting that we, um, We've had a project called the Sustainable Investment Research Initiative, or CIRI. We cheekily called it for short, but Apple doesn't seem to mind too much. They've smiled <laughs> at us. Um, so in our first CIRI, we collected 800 papers. And in the second, we collected another 1,000 academic papers on this topic. And we, um, uh, at the board's request, included um, two new topics. One was diversity, and the second was income inequality. Um, so we will be able to come back later next year or later this year with um, some findings, in particular where we've been working with the PRI, because this isn't something that CalPERS can progress on its own. And we've been working with the PRI, which has had a series of workshops on these topics. So that's definitely in the work program. Are there any other questions or comments on this? Um, one page, the, s the snap, the one page. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, <coughs> climate change, just by way of background. Um, I think the science has been uh, building steadily and surely over decades. And the scientific models on climate change, we're actually being told by some of our managers, I'm thinking of Spencer Glendon at Wellington, that the science modeling is actually better than the financial modeling. <laughs> Um, we can actually learn a lot from how science approaches modeling of risk, um, which is important. Um, and you'll also recall that just before the Paris Climate uh, Agreement, where CalPERS was represented on behalf of many other investors, um, 
this board agreed that we would sign up for the PRI's Montreal Pledge. And what that meant is we'd map our own carbon footprint um, initially in our global equity portfolio. And as you know, we've since done it for our global fixed income. So CalPERS is always wanting to be one step ahead. So, But out of that work, um, looking at 11,000 companies, we found that less than 100 were responsible for more than half of the emissions. Um, so really that gave us a very simple idea, which was that if CalPERS, with its 11,000 companies in nearly 50 markets, if we had such concentrated emissions exposure, that might be the case with our fellow asset owners as well. Um, and we held a meeting at the, uh, hosted by the French um, mission to the UN, um, which was co-hosted by the California and New York State controllers, really to explore with other asset owners and managers, well, would you be willing to join us in developing a focus list? And there's a lot of excitement and interest at the idea. And so then we've spent a year uh, looking at the methodology, how to choose the companies, what would, what would we ask these companies to do? We don't want them to stop doing business. We actually want them to make the transition to a low carbon economy and thrive and be profitable and financially successful because we need those returns. So we've actually got this um, new strategy on climate change, which is saying we, the owners of these companies, could link arms and in partnership with the companies, develop this new strategy, which is for a, a future which is going to be <coughs> successful on, back to the same three, financial capital, human, and physical capital. Um, so with that idea, um, um, I'd like to turn over to, to Divya, um, who has played such a, an important leadership role in this work, um, both on the analytics, but also in developing the strategy. Um, so Divya, over to you to tell us um, sort of like uh, the next chapter, chapter two in the story of CalPERS on, on climate change. Thank you, Anne and Ted and Marcy. Um, so it's exciting. We've reached an exciting place in this engagement strategy. So we almost couldn't wait for March um, to share with you all some of the progress that we've seen over the past year. Um, as Anne mentioned, taking our Montre UNPRI uh, Montreal Pledge carbon footprint, we started to speak with peer asset owners around the world, <coughs> and just as she mentioned, found that they had also found a similar concentration of um, carbon risk in, you know, a hundred or so companies out of the thousands that they invest in. So from there, we turned to our peer um, investor networks, uh, series in North America, the UNPRI as a global organization, and organizations that perform a similar role for each of the regions in which we're invested in. Um, there's a similar group in Europe, Australia, Asia, et cetera. And formed a steering committee in order to have a diplomatic process where we were really taking in ideas from different parts of the globe. Um, because this type of global coordination in engaging a focus list of companies has not been um, attempted before to our knowledge. Um, and so this year spent, this group spent the last year looking at methodology, at resources, research, coming up with this list of 100 companies that is relevant to global institutional investors. And um, in putting this list together, we partnered uh, also with the CDP who has been researching carbon data for um, over well over a decade at this point. Um, we looked at, just to delve into sort of the details of the list for a second, um, we looked at scope one, two, and three emissions, which is also a uh, sort of newer practice um, and an evolution of our carbon footprint. And that allows us to look at the direct emissions of the 100 companies um, in terms of the assets that they own, but also their indirect emissions from electricity they're purchasing or from assets they have either up in their value chain um, or you know, as part of their products in the transportation sector. Um, so 
in short, the result of all of this activity has led us um, just in the last uh, one month ago to launch the Climate Action 100 Plus, as it's known. And it's a new five-year engagement initiative led by investors, four investors, to engage with the world's largest corporate greenhouse gas emitters uh, in order to improve their governance of climate change, curb emissions in order to help us mitigate the risks of climate change to our total fund, um, and strengthen climate-related financial disclosures so we can understand how we are progressing. Um, the goal is to ensure that these companies bring their business strategies in line with the two degrees goal set out in the Paris Agreement. And having developed the idea with our partners on the steering committee, um, we knew that we needed to launch this idea publicly to seek support from other investors. Um, we did this as a sort of soft launch at the PRI in-person meeting in Berlin. Thank you, Priya, for leading that discussion. Um, and we had a tremendous response. Uh, we then went around and informed each of the 100 companies um, that they were on the list to begin the process of engagement and really to reinforce this message that we are partnering with companies um, for our shared prosperity. And at the end of that process, we launched publicly at the One Planet Summit in Paris on December 12th. And I am pleased and proud to say that working collaboratively with many parts of the CalPERS enterprise, public affairs, the legal office, um, and also with our partners externally, <laughs> drum roll please. <laughs> We were successful in getting, oh, that was just a, <laughs> a, <laughs> a brief okay. glimpse, there we go. Uh, we were <laughs> able to launch just six weeks after sounding the call to action with $27 trillion worth of investors signing up in support of this engagement initiative, um, which is the sum of 225 individual investors from around the globe. And we're just getting started. <laughs> right, and so in terms of um, the scale of this impact, first let me thank um, Controller Yi who <coughs> represented CalPERS um, as we were selected to actually speak on behalf of the entire network um, at the event. Um, to take a step back into sort of the details of the initiative, delivering on the Paris Agreement requires the global economy to reduce emissions by 80% uh, by 2050. And that's quite a considerable um, reduction that we are looking for. And we're also looking to pursue a just transition with those employed in the impacted sectors. So it's important to have investors as part of the discussion. And what we found in this list is that the 100 companies are actually responsible for 85% of annual greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel combustion. So this is really an exciting moment where investors can actually play a role in partnering with companies for our shared prosperity um, in addressing a large percentage of the emissions that we need to reduce in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and by doing so, mitigate physical, financial, and transition risks to our total fund. Um, the emission trajectory of these top 100 carbon emitters, um, we're calling them systemically important carbon emitters, and we're pleased to see that uh, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, and also the person who encouraged the Financial Stability Board to take up the topic of climate-related financial disclosure, has picked up on this term. Um, so, Sikis, yes. Um, so just a bit about that list, 34 of these companies are headquartered in Europe, 31 in North America, and 27 in Asia, with the remaining in South America, Australia, and Africa. 
And in terms of sectors, it's much beyond um, the oil and gas sector or utilities. It's actually a list that also includes transportation, industrials, mining companies, consumer goods brands. So it's really a multi-sector um, engagement initiative, which is exciting and interesting for our team as well. Um, and then an additional plus list of companies will be added for those that are sort of regionally important um, and may not be in this uh, initial 100 list of companies. Um, over the next two months, the steering committee will be coordinating with the 225 plus members who have um, joined up to engage as part of the Climate Action 100 plus to identify lead investors for each of the 100 companies. And there, um, what we're trying to do is really have local investors lead on engagement with companies in their region and bring the influence and the advice and research of global investors su to support those um, local investors. The goal of um, the initiative, as mentioned earlier, is to really enhance corporate climate-related financial disclosure. And here we look to an international benchmark um, that we actually helped to inform with our experience as an investor, which is the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. A mouthful. It's <laughs> referred to as the TCFD. Um, which is the industry, sh industry standard really for how companies should disclose on their governance, their strategy, their risk management plans, and their metrics and targets uh, with relation to climate change, of course. So we're looking for these 100 companies to provide disclosure in line with this industry benchmark. Um, importantly, as part of that, to tackle um, reduced greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Paris targets, and as always, um, to implement a strong governance framework so that we clearly understand how the board of each of these companies has oversight and is driving uh, the changes that we're looking for um, in order to have greater accountability and oversight. Um, as for the scale, while we launched with 27 trillion, and we're very proud of that, um, what we're looking for is a seek to seek a critical mass of share owner support at each of the firms. So we continue to recruit um, members. And for example, we have uh, estimated about 25% of Exxon share owners have already signed up as Climate Action 100 plus members. Um, from an investor perspective, this disclosure will help us price climate risk appropriately. Again, because we'll have disclosure from the companies in line with risk, governance, metrics and targets, and strategy, we hope that this will help inform the market on how to price climate risk and gain visibility into which firms are preparing for the financial impacts from both the physical and transition risks presented by climate change. Um, to track progress in how the market is pricing climate risks, we will track financial metrics related to returns and of course the earnings and ultimately capital allocation strategies on which they depend um, across the Climate Action 100 plus firms. So just to close with next steps, um, we are excited to have this initiative. It's really a global partnership that allows us to deliver on one of the six strategic um, ESG goals that, we, that Anne and Ted covered earlier. Um, and as we uh, look at that, we're actually kind of getting um, a bit ambitious in a good way <laughs> where <laughs> we are able to address all of the 100 Climate Action Plus companies by utilizing partnerships. Yeah. So while we will maintain our focus on our KPI in the goal of um, uh, engaging 20 companies per year, we actually, from year one, by having these partners focusing on each of the companies, are beginning to have a dialogue with all 100. Um, as we turn to goals for 2018, CalPERS has, again, volunteered to serve as lead investor on a number of those firms, uh, lead engager, rather. 
on a number of those firms. And um, that allows us to engage with firms where we have a relationship, but also to expand beyond that to sectors like transportation, for example, which I mentioned earlier, that are a bit newer to investor dialogue on climate change. Um, in addition, we'll leverage our experience engaging in Japan and Malaysia to support the Asian investor group on climate change. As we know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 27 of the companies are based in Asia, and we are one of the global investors that have um, significant exposure in that region. So we're looking to partner with those investors and that particular investor network um, to help augment relationship on and discussion on climate change with those firms. Um, I think we're already seeing a shift underway. Um, and so just to uh, close on a couple of points that we can hopefully see as um, this initiative starting to have an impact, but of course it's the result of many years of dialogue with companies um, Exxon announced the same week as we launched the initiative that it will be incorporating a two degrees strategy into its business planning and making its board available to key investors. Occidental Petroleum also the same week announced it will issue a similar report and um, importantly CalPERS co-filed climate risk disclosure resolutions at both of these firms which won majority votes of 67 and 62 percent, respectively. So we're hopeful for <laughs> continued success, but of course continuing to be um, humble that this is really only possible through partnership with global investor networks and with the companies in which we invest, um, and look forward to giving you another update on the success that we continue to see, hopefully, <laughs> in March. Well, thank you so much, uh, Divya and Anne. Uh, let me just pause a brief moment uh, before we move into the next section, which will be covering the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, just to see if there are any, any questions uh, of us on our plan or the Climate Action uh, 100. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Yee. Thank you, Madam President. Oh, I think you have to turn on your... took the step of uh, doing our own kind of research on that for this uh, this uh, emphasis for living in the face of climate crisis. Uh, the recognition of our leadership here is is, uh, is really is, is uh, noted. Um, I wanted to see if um, on slide two where you have the summary of the project and whether under partnerships it might not be warranted to actually call out Climate Action 100 Plus. It's a different kind of engagement and I think one that um, it's going to be cross-cutting, and I know we have corporate engagements listed, but I'm, um, I think just given the recognition of the leadership role that CalPERS is taking, uh, I wanted to entertain whether we could uh, just start to highlight that as part of the, the uh, partnership. <coughs> that we're um, well, thank you very much. <coughs> I think um, you know, CalPERS has long been a thought leader on these issues, and it certainly predates me. And, uh, and in California as well, has taken such a leadership role. Um, so we're all very proud and, and pleased with this work, but we know that it's, uh, it's the work of many. Um, on the partnership work, it's a, it's a very good point because I think what we're thinking about as we uh, you know, talk with Ted and the senior team about resources, actually um, developing and maintaining these partnerships and relationships, it's the key to all of our success. We can't do anything on our own. Um, we might be big, but we have very small holdings. So I, I think that's very much on our mind. Um, how can we make sure that um, CalPERS can continue because we have a global portfolio to have a, a global presence, um, but really spend the time and care to make sure we um, really nurture these relationships because they're so important. So I look forward to uh, hopefully some more specific mention of Climate Action 100. And then uh, I think a question to Ted on the um, ESG strategy timeline. I just had a question uh, with regard to the um, SB 185 engagement. And um, 
I, I, and maybe it's just really more of a question of what's the status with respect to the divestment from thermal coal and, and what, is, what is this engagement that's listed under um, January 2018? So this is the thermal, the thermal coal yeah. uh, engagement strategy. Why don't I turn that over to, uh, to Anne who's leading that? To yeah. To no, thank you very much for the question. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge Kit Crocker and her team uh, in i who've been leading this work. Um, so as the, as the Act requires, there's been an analysis done to see where in our portfolio we have exposure to companies with, uh, I believe, 30% of revenues. I'm looking at kit. 30% of revenues from thermal coal, not from metallurgical coal, which is a different thing altogether. Um, and we've identified a group of companies and asked them if they have a plan to uh, transition the business in line with the Paris Agreement. And several have. So we think our role is to continue with them. Um, and then the next part of the uh, process is to do a fiduciary analysis to look at whether the financial holdings that we have with these companies is something with material <coughs> impact for the fund. Um, and that analysis um, has been undertaken. Um, and that then sets the stage for um, a decision as to whether the request for divestment under the bill can be carried out. Um, and that process is underway. Is that, would you like to add to that, Kit? Yeah. 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 That's what process underway means in <laughs> British. <laughs> Do we have a microphone? Perhaps that'd be helpful. I don't think for everyone staff, can hear yeah. from the audience. Uh, let's just see if maybe Kit, you can summarize what you know. Oh, here, yes. So, so sorry. To, to right. summarize, um, there is a distinction between the work that my team does, which is divestment compliance in response to statutory mandates, and, and the important work that Anne's team does, which is furthering the ESG goals of the board. So uh, to, we have completed, to my knowledge, uh, compliance with SB 185, including the divestment. That was an agenda item last year, uh, decided by, by the investment committee. And uh, so we would not plan as the divestment compliance team to do more engagement in that area uh, because we've, you know, we've completed that. Uh, what I think would be you know, it, it is an appropriate topic, of course, that is being covered, I believe, in by Anne's team when they talk about engagement around climate risk. And Mickey, the final question. Yeah, yeah. 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 final question. Uh, and probably not answerable today, but uh, as we go forward, obviously things get complicated when we see investors that are uh, moving a little out of step and with the recent announcement by um, New York City on divestment, uh, what that will mean for this um, collaborative engagement, so. Uh, yeah. You're teeing up some really good questions uh, and engagement that will be taking up almost the entire day in March in the investment committee, really to work through the strategic plan, what's changed, what progress we have on thermal coal, these engagements, what others have done. So it's a really good uh, preview uh, for coming in March. Thank you. Mr. Costigan. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, just a couple points, and I think it answered. At least on 185, we're done. And Ms. Simpson, I'm sorry, I may have misunderstood. Not enough. What was the 30% in revenues you were referencing? Um, <coughs> this is a hurdle in the um, in the statute for identifying companies which have a proportion of their revenues from thermal coal. Got it. Okay, not 30% yeah. of our revenues. All right. So in reverse, great report, and just uh, I heard y'all did, including the controller, fantastic work. Uh, in Europe and Priya, I get, I hear from other people uh, the work ah. that y'all did. Um, <laughs> I think you know one of my former employers was over there. Um, yes. Just a couple things, uh, just in reverse. So of the 275 trillion. I wish. I mean, 27 trillion. I, I, like, even, I, I like the ambition. Okay. I like you know, the a billion, a trillion, <laughs> it's just a zero. Um, what I'm trying to get at is of the 100 companies, so, so first of all, do we rank them as to who's the worst admitter? Okay, and where is that list? Um, 
worst. Well, we've identified. Is we're not in. We're not in the the blame business here, because if you're in an industry with very high emissions, the question is, where do you go? Okay. So you could you could rank Apple and you could rank Exxon and say, wow. Exxon is worse, but it's by the nature of the business that they're in. But we've established, sorry, Ms. Simpson, we've established a minimum threshold to identify at least 100 companies. So I'm going to pass over to Divya to talk about how we've done that methodology okay. because it sounds like mumbo jumbo, but scope one, two, and three are the different way, that's a measuring stick around emissions. So, Divya, do you want to just sure. um, dive so into that? Sure. So, what we actually bit? did is work. <coughs> Um, with the data set that covers the largest number of companies' carbon emissions. And we included scope one, which is the direct emissions, scope two, which is emissions from purchased electricity, and scope three, which could relate to um, reserves in the case of oil and gas companies or emissions from the products in use in terms of transportation companies. And these 100 companies are actually the largest hundred emitters globally. So if you take the list of mm -hmm. several thousand companies that are publicly listed, um, covered by the CDP, carbon, what used to be called Carbon Disclosure Project um, data set, these are the top 100 No, and I understand emitters. that. What I guess I'm getting at is, do we further break down in the methodology one through 100, or are they all equally weighted? So we do have, um, because we have that underlying data of their total emissions, we do know who is the largest emitter. So where's that report? In March. Okay, so we'll see that in March. Yeah. The second question is, of the 27 trillion, <coughs> do we break it down by, so I, I understand we want to be the lead investor in many of these companies. So Exxon, for example, do we have a breakdown, or could we see this in March, Madam President, of among the $27 trillion, who holds what percentage? Does that document exist? Um, yes, at the moment we're, uh, we're doing guesstimates. So we're taking an assumption with the 27 trillion. We were asked by, I think, one of the media, so what does that mean for Exxon? And you know, we talked with our global equity colleagues and said, well, if everybody holds a market waiting, and we don't know that yet, yes. but let's assume everyone holds a market waiting, we uh, together have 25% of Exxon's share register. Of the 27 trillion? The 27 trillion dollars, making an assumption we all hold a market waiting. Okay. And that, thank you, Ms. Simpson. And some that's will be a bit over, some will be a bit under, but just, just for. That's what I'd like, yeah. Madam President, or, or Mr. Eliopoulos in March, is of the 27 trillion, how much of that 27 trillion is represented among the 100? And then among those 100, what is the percentage breakout? Because uh, you know, if we own 1% of company X, uh, and the, the total is 10 percent, then the question is, is, is a strategic standpoint, until you cross a threshold of 30, 40, or 50 percent in ownership, yeah, what right. is the, and then the, the last point I would certainly encourage you, and I'm looking at Mr. Leopolis as the head of, of investments with Ms. Simpson, to ask for the resources. Yeah. Um, this is an important issue. Resources should not be a limitation or a barrier. I mean, I would certainly hope you bring it to the board, whether it's staff, technology, whatever it may be that the board, through Ms. Ms. Mother, uh, over the last several years, and I know as, as president this will be a, a goal she'll continue to follow, is that we need to have the, the resources. So I, I heard that several times, is that we're having to pick and choose because we do not have the resources. I do think it is something that should be brought forth. Thank you, Madam President. All right, Ms. Taylor. Did you want to answer to that, Anne? It looked like you were grabbing the mic to answer to that, or um, Ted? The answer is yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I also wanted to chime in. I think this is fantastic, and you have every right, your report, uh, to be ambitious and, and a little bit egotistical about this. I think uh, CalPERS, as usual, is the forerunner in, in getting this accomplished, the thought leader, and I'm very proud of the work you guys have done. So I just wanted to chime in with that. And I also wanted to, I think I've said this many times as well, chime in with Mr. Koskin. Obviously, if resources are needed to continue uh, identifying or continue going forward in these ESG strategies and our five-year strategy, please let us know so that we can get that to you. So again, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. 
Thank you for that. And uh, for sure, on the resources side, uh, we will keep that in mind. The, uh, the other um, point to really underscore here is the power of setting a priority and coalescing the entire reputation and resources of, of CalPERS around uh, our most Im you know, important priorities. This is really the signature case of the power of that prioritization. It allowed us to devote uh, the resources uh, of our entire investment team. Uh, so our global equity team, our sustainability team, uh, as well as board members and their affiliations with different, um, uh, different of our partners. So that, uh, that combination of having a set priority and devoting all of the assets of CalPERS uh, to achieve a goal is yeah. very powerful. I, th I thought that uh, was great, as well as the partnerships you guys yeah, cul cultivated for that and being able to thereby contacting all 100 companies where we, with our own resources, would not be able to do that, but other partners were able to help with that. So I think that's a tremendous asset as well. Terrific. Are there any further, uh, any additional board members who wish to speak at this time? We do have one member of the public who's requested to speak, um, Mr. Darby, and if we could get a, him a microphone. I think the microphone's over there, Al, if you don't mind coming over to the table over here. Thank you. And you'll have three minutes you wish to speak, although we don't really have a timer. <laughs> the issue here is, uh, do we have our eye on the right ball? Um, we question, uh, I'm uh, Al Darby, RPEA, I'm sorry I didn't uh, identify myself. Um, how has ESG contributed or detracted from the PERF's in funded status? That's a serious question because uh, we, we need to be focused on funded status. What is the goal, lead in social issues or improve the PERF? While the ESG has social, obvious social merit, it appears to be a drag on investment appreciation based on many experts. Uh, a greatly improved funded status should be the current focus. De-emphasizing ESG should be a priority along with de-emphasizing, as we did, uh, divestment. Until funded status is restored to 80% at least, we need to be focused on investment return as opposed to ESG or any other uh, di distractions. At this point in time, CalPERS must build PERF sustainability by putting ESG and other distractions on the back burner. Finally, ESG should be a factor only if it is investment return focused. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Darby. Okay, so we are running a little bit behind, um, so, uh, but I'll turn it back over to Ted for the next item, which is, um, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. Yes, thank you, uh, Ms. Ma there. Uh, which slide? Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Oh. <laughs> we continue to uh, have techno technology issues with our, uh, with our clicker management, <laughs> so with... Uh, yeah, some issues. So we'll, uh, we'll tr we're trying to get uh, the map of the UN's SDGs up on up on the screen for convenience sake. Uh, we have until uh, we've scheduled budgeted the agenda until 11 o'clock for this discussion. Which uh, even though we're a bit a bit behind, I think the setting is really important. Both the setting of our own strategic plan and now turning uh, to the United Nations sustainable development goals and its framework, I think it is important to take the time to set the stage for why do we talk about uh, these topics? What is the connection to the investment portfolio? Uh, what does it mean when we talk about thinking of these dimensions in terms of our risk to our current portfolio as well as, as opportunities? Uh, so I'll try and use this transition period as I introduce um, our external speaker uh, to cover some of uh, some of those uh, topics as well. Uh, first, let me uh, let me uh, welcome and and call up to uh, to join us here on uh, on the panel on the stage here, 
uh, our keynote speaker, Elliot Harris, who's making his way here. Uh, Elliot is the Assistant General Secretary of the United Nations and head of the New York Office of the UN Environment Program. Uh, in your board materials, we've provided much information on, on Elliot's impressive uh, biography, which shows really what an extraordinary career uh, that he has had to date as an economist at the IMF and also Chief of the Development Issues Division and as Assistant Director of IMF's Strategy, Policy, and Review Department. It is quite a uh, range and dizzying array and dazzling array of responsibilities in, in your career, which shows his leadership role on the international uh, stage, all focusing on the financial markets interplay with public policy on this stage for many, uh, many years. Uh, we are absolutely honored and delighted uh, that Elliot and his team have uh, made their way and traveled uh, from New York to join us uh, here this morning uh, to speak to you all, our CalPERS board, on the theme of the Sustainable Development Goals and what do they mean uh, for investors. Uh, before I uh, turn it over to Elliot, I did want to spend a few minutes really setting, uh, setting the stage uh, a bit for why uh, we're bringing forward this, um, uh, this very important development at the UN for this discussion. As many, of, uh, uh, as, as many in the audience know, and certainly our board uh, knows uh, very well, because you participated with us, uh, CalPERS was you know, diligently working away on our strategic plan that we just discussed, both the prioritization effort that we went through to look at all the possible permutations of things environmental, all the permutations of things uh, social and things, and all the permutations uh, of our governance work. Uh, while we were doing that and really uh, looking throughout the globe and trying to assess our own priority setting for what are the impacts from E, S, and G topic areas on our investment portfolio, which ultimately led us to choosing the priorities and timeline that you, s that you saw. Um, the UN was busy convening and coordinating a discussion with close to 200 member uh, government states to really work out on the global stage, on the global agenda, what, uh, what, is, uh, what is the term sustainability and what are the environmental and social sustainability goals of the world's governments? Uh, we've had, CalPERS has had a close and collaborative relationship uh, with the UN and its agencies, agencies over the years, uh, including PRI, which we'll hear from a little bit later. Uh, this partnership has been fruitful and, um, and established a, a good uh, working relationship over literally a decade. Um, CalPERS, on our own uh, work, commissioned, and Anne touched on this, our own extensive research of the academic evidence to see what analysis and research on data had been done to connect environmental, social, and governance issues to investment risk and return. Uh, the uh, research that we looked through, the 800 or 1,000 different uh, research articles uh, through the Siri project, really told us that uh, with respect to governance, and our experience certainly uh, bears that research work out well, uh, there's quite a body of evidence that uh, good governance uh, affects and improves the performance of the companies that, uh, that we invest in. Uh, that is why on the governance uh, side, CalPERS has a long-standing effort by our investment staff and this board to really pay attention to the governance of the companies that we invest in because the research and the data 
uh, bears out that investment thesis that paying attention to uh, governance uh, is important both to steer companies on a sustainable uh, path of financial return, but also a strong governance structure allows companies to deal uh, with troubles uh, when they come. And uh, in both dimensions, uh, governance matters for long-term investment returns. Uh, we've also reviewed the academic research around environmental and social issues. And there, there's uh, less, certainly less of a conclusion. We have not reached a conclusion with respect to uh, the E and the S and its impact on investment returns. And I think that's why there's this discussion and debate over uh, why pay attention to these themes uh, given the evolving nature both of the, uh, the, the issues themselves as well as their connection to investment performance. And they're one of the topics that we've underscored is the lack of high quality data uh, uh, to really measure uh, uh, the impact of these issues on investment returns, which is why one of the highest priorities of our strategic plan is to uh, increase the quality of corporate reporting, uh, particularly on material risk uh, to companies from the dimensions of environmental and social uh, issues. Uh, now, as I mentioned, while CalPERS was working diligently uh, on these issues, the UN Community of Nations really embarked on this extraordinary uh, project to identify what the governments of the world would agree are their shared goals, their objectives to, pr to provide for a more sustainable uh, framework for, uh, for the world's nations. The result is the sustainable development goals that you see uh, uh, colorfully depicted uh, on, on one page. Uh, seven and underlying uh, those uh, squares uh, are 17 really ambitious targets to address uh, human uh, needs, both social and environmental. It's an exceptional feat to have convened close to 100 world governments and had a process actually to come to a global consensus on goals for the next 25 years for environmental and social sustainability. Uh, now, for investors, I really regard this work, and I don't think it was the intention of the UN uh, in putting these goals together to think of, think of investors, but for investors, uh, this work is uh, truly a gift. Uh, that was the term that the, the head of APG uh, coined for the Sustainable Development Goals, and uh, I certainly uh, agree with that. Uh, the gift to investors is what we saw in putting together our own strategic plan, in that uh, we were looking for a framework of goals. Uh, what what is an ag agreed upon, uh, uh, I'm going to say authoritative, but independent view of what, uh, what uh, environmental and social uh, uh, parameters are needed for long-term and sustainable growth around the globe. And the in steps the UN uh, with their producing a framework uh, from their member governments ranging from the United States to China, from Russia to Saudi Arabia, from Belgium to Bangladesh. And CalPERS, we are a global investor. We invest in close to 50 markets around the world, developed, emerging, and developing. To have this framework to guide policymakers, uh, for set targets for progress, and ensure coordination, coordination gives us a lens uh, for the financial markets uh, to think through how these policy topics will impact uh, investment returns in the companies that we invest in. Uh, for CalPERS, it gives us an important check on our own strategies. Uh, and I think part of our work in March will be to look at our own work in this regard and how it, uh, how it ties to the work of the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, for that, uh, for that reason, uh, we're just delighted that uh, 
Elliot, that you'd make the time to be here with us today. We very much look forward to hearing your remarks on how these goals were put together and, and, and the process that was used and, and the meaning uh, behind them. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Elliot Harris to, uh, to CalPERS. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, let me start by thanking the, the board of CalPERS for giving us the opportunity to come and uh, dialogue directly with you on this shared agenda that we have. Uh, Ted's quite right. It is uh, an unprecedented effort, something that we did not expect to have achieved the, the reach and the influence that it has done in the last 18 months. And perhaps uh, the best way to start off is with a little bit of a, of a background, a little bit of a context as to where this all came from, because I think that then conditions our assessment of how important it might be for the way we proceed going forward. Uh, as you know, the agenda was adopted, what we call the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by the 193 member states of the United Nations in September of 2015. But the concept of sustainable development itself goes back 30 years to 1987 to the report of the Brundtland Commission, which was charged with looking at the tension between economic development and the environmental degradation people were starting to see at that time. And they coined the phrase sustainable development as a way in which we can treat the environment and the economy as inseparable. And under the environment, we look not only at the physical world around us, but also the social and the political conditions that determine how we live in that physical world. It is essentially an, a, a concept of how we, in our generation now, can improve our living standards and meet our needs without compromising the ability of succeeding generations to do the same thing. It is, in essence, a multi-generational or intergenerational equity approach. Now, that concept was used in the first conference on sustainable development at Rio in 1992. That was the conference when the world started for the first time systematically to look at issues of environmental degradation. That's the place where the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which we know and love so well, uh, was adopted back in 1992. But in the ensuing years, very little additional progress was actually made. And I tend to try to explain that by referring to a couple of factors. One, we had a period w which we've now started to call the Great Moderation, a period of unprecedented economic success where we managed to get regular, very strong growth rates around the world and avoid some of the cyclical disruptions that had characterized previous periods. And we actually found ourselves believing that we'd learned how to do it. We'd learned how to manage our economies to avoid these disruptions, and we expected that those economic advances would translate into better social outcomes. We didn't know exactly how, but we expected that that would happen. And we also thought that we would be able to manage the environmental disruptions after the fact. But there were two things that happened, I think, that changed that mindset and that lead us now to think about these things in entirely different ways. The first one was the, the fact that the science on climate change started to intrude into public debate and into political dialogue. People started to look at, sci at the science of the degradation of our climate as a symbol, if you will, for the fact that environmental disruptions could be much more serious than we had anticipated, and some of the damage might even turn out to be irreversible. That was the first thing. The second thing was, of course, the global financial and economic crisis, because that shook at its very core our belief that we had learned how to manage the economy. And it caused us to question a lot of things that we had thought were dealt with before. So we realized that the economic paradigm that we had was not quite enough, and it was this that was the context for the second Rio conference that took place in 2012, where the governments agreed that we needed a new approach. And that new approach was identified, articulated around the principles of sustainable development, the rediscovered principle of sustainable development, and the process was launched to come up with the sustainable development agenda. So what are these SDGs? The agenda is an integrated and holistic approach that combines economic, social, and environmental dimensions of development with a view of putting us on a trajectory of sustainable, uh, of true sustainability, let's put it that way. It's focused on people, on prosperity, and on the planet. It's about uh, just, equitable, and sustainable patterns of low carbon, resource efficient economic growth. It's about generating socially acceptable outcomes that empower women and marginal groups. It's about integrating ecological considerations into social and economic policies 
at all stages, and it's about leaving no one behind. That, at the high level, is what this agenda seeks to achieve. It looks to do this by fundamentally transforming the patterns of our lives and the way we interact with each other, about how we produce, how we consume, the way we use and think about the physical world, about the way we act uh, with regard to our social objectives. Most important of all, I think, is that this is a truly universal agenda. The previous approaches to development were always aimed at certain categories of countries. This one ap appeals to, engages all countries and all societies. Perhaps as important as the content of the agenda is the open and consultative process through which it was achieved. And I think this is the real novum in it all. Uh, it was a process that brought together not just all of the governments of the world, but major stakeholder groups, private business, private finance, the civil society organizations, academicians, researchers, philanthropic institutions. And all of their views and opinions were brought together. It was a, a really Herculean effort, but you ended up with an outcome where all of these stakeholder groups could see the interests and the opinions that they had brought to the table. So it was a really participatory process, and that explains the unprecedented degree of buy-in that we see now to the sustainable development agenda. And this has major implications, because if the governments of the world hold true to their commitments as they set out in this agenda, it means that we now have a very clear and predictable direction of public policy. And that sets a clear orientation for private sector activity. We know, just as we know from the, private, from the Paris Agreement, what governments plan to do. And within that context, it makes it easier for private sector investment decisions to be taken. Specifically, uh, as you see here, there are 17 high-level goals, and they are underpinned by 169 different targets. The first set of the goals, goals number one through 10, pertain to people and to prosperity. They deal with reducing inequality, raising incomes, er eradicating ine inequalities, and ensuring access to basic services for all. Goals 11 through 15 are the physical ones. They deal with the planet. And goals 16 and 17 are the enabling framework, if you will, and the partnerships in particular that are needed to make this happen. Because these goals are very complex. Each one is interwoven somehow with each other one. And that means that the agenda is too complex to be managed through a single approach. You need to have an integrated policy approach where each dimension, the policies in each dimension take into account what is going on in the other dimensions. You need transformational investments, and these investments are massive in size. They go well beyond what any government or any set of governments could ever hope to fund. And this means that our sustainable future depends on the engagement of the private sector, the private business, and more importantly, private finance. Third, this is a long-term agenda. It, it comes to culmination in 2030. It has a pronounced multi-generational aspect and perspective. And of course, this is a bit of a challenge for private finance, whose time horizons are generally somewhat shorter than that. Uh, equally important, this is not about north-south. It's not about rich countries and poor countries. It's about all of us together. It addresses problems that exist in some form in all societies. And finally, because of its complexity, it means that no one actor can hope to deliver this agenda acting on his or her own. We need partnerships. We need innovative al alliances. And we need to have this uh, recognized, that the agenda itself is not the responsibility only of governments. It's, it's a shared responsibility of all of us. So we have a sustainable uh, development agenda to which all governments and virtually all stakeholder groups have agreed. And uh, this agenda also has affected the way in which countries think about their policy frameworks and the way they should uh, pursue their own development. But it also has um, major implications for the role of the United Nations, per se. We, um, we have to continue to use our convening power to bring around the table all of the stakeholders who are going to be so central to making this uh, a reality or, or not. We can act as, a, as an honest broker. The, the individual stakeholder groups each have their own sets of interests, and sometimes these interests are in competition with each other, and we can help uh, to mediate among these different um, interests. We can act as a sustainability advisor. We can help uh, actors to understand what is sustainable and what is not. And that's particularly important when we look at private finance, where that definition of sustainability is not yet clear. And finally, we can help to demonstrate to each group that it is, it, it is in the interest of each group that this global agenda succeeds. It's not just a collective objective. It makes sense for every group. 
I said at the beginning, this is an agenda of transformation, fundamental transformations in the patterns of production. We move towards low carbon, resource efficient, energy efficient forms of, of production that minimize waste and that are ecologically sound. And these are things like sustainable agriculture and food systems, transportation systems, clean energy, water, and access to digital technologies that are driving our world today. It aims for sustainable patterns of consumption as well. We need to be more healthy in what we consume and how we consume it. We need to be less resource intensive, less energy intensive in our consumption requirements. But it also aims to transform the way in which we address some of the obstacles to achieving our social objectives. I mean, we, we, we mentioned earlier in the presentations this morning the, the income and wealth inequalities that prevent us from dealing with the widening inequalities that are going on around the world. We need to ensure that there is equitable access to key social services, otherwise we won't be able to, to, to achieve the first ten of these goals. We need to look at the future of work. We know that we will need a lot of efficiency enhancing technologies to step away from some of these environmentally damaging production patterns, but many of these technologies have adverse implications for human work. And these have to be taken into account. We need a sustainable pattern of urbanization. Uh, by 2050, three quarters of humanity will live in cities. And if we don't get our cities right, we will not succeed in sustainable development. And all of this has to be fit into, mainstreamed into economic and financial policies. And that means that we have to look not just at profit and loss uh, or the individual outcomes of projects, but we have to look at how these projects, these activities may have social and ecological consequences. And that has to be part of the policymaking process. For these transformations to happen, we need new technologies, new infrastructure, we need new policies, and we need new behavior. And that means we have to invest. We have to invest in, in these new technologies, in resilient infrastructure, in housing, in energy systems, in clean and renewable energy, water, sanitation, and, and housing. We also need to invest in raising the awareness of what are the implications, the consequences of unsustainable behavior, and what are the alternatives that are more sustainable, that are available, and that, that we can choose. We have to invest in generating the data and the scientific evidence that will inform our policies and help us to decide what kind of progress are we making, what is working and what is not working well. And perhaps most important of all, we need to invest in developing a sustainable financial system. We need a system that can mobilize the resources that we need to fund these transformational investments. But such a system would have to be more inclusive than the one we have today. It will have to be able to provide finance also to small and medium-sized enterprises at a reasonable uh, cost. And it will have to be able to encourage a shift away from the types of unsustainable investments that we do today towards investments that are more sustainable and more future-oriented. It is really all about investments. And the scale of the investments that we're talking about is, is mind-boggling. Estimates range from two to seven trillion dollars a year. Now, obviously, this is beyond the capacity of any and all governments put together, which means that our sustainable future depends on the private sector, on private business for the solutions, and on private finance for the money. Now, the money is there, but to mobilize that money requires a completely different set of priorities and policies and framing, and a completely different role of the public sector, which has to move away from leading the investments into enabling them and providing access to the kinds of instruments and policies that help to de-risk the exposure of the private sector, which is perhaps one of the largest <coughs> hindrances to engagement in this kind of new endeavor and new investments. Because private finance, private business, they obey different incentive systems and, and, and different frameworks of, of, of policy. They have shorter time horizons and they focus on bankability of projects and on the return on investment. But and this is the real hope that we see, increasingly we find investors taking other considerations into account as well. And you heard about that this morning, the presentations that Ted and Anne gave you. We find positive impact investing or, or value-based value investments. These are approaches that are gaining currency. We find companies increasingly taking sustainability considerations and building them into their management uh, models as part of an approach where the sustainable choice is increasingly becoming the good business choice, sustainably being good for business and also being good business at the same time. Perhaps one 
easy way to illustrate how these changes are happening uh, is to refer to the catastrophic weather events that we had over the last uh, few months, the, the three hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, and then the massive flooding that occurred in parts of, of Asia a few months ago, generating hundreds of billions of dollars of damage and killing thousands of people. You had meteorologists and climatologists sitting there and debating the extent to which climate change was responsible for the intensity of these storms or the frequency of their occurrence, and some misguided politi politicians got involved in all of that too. And when you look at the insurance sector, that's not at all how the debate is being framed. The insurance sector has long recognized that climate change is a, an underwriting risk and is a part of the business risk and is being managed as such. The kinds of scenario building and weather-related risk and loss um, assessments and modeling, they're part of the fabric of how the insurance industry today does its business. Investors, too, are starting to ask how exposed are companies to these kinds of climate-related risks. What we see happening is that the climate debate has awakened the business and the financial community to the broader and intensifying risks of unsustainability in a much wider sense. It's forcing them to confront the challenges of measuring and assessing these risks and figuring out how exposure to these risks could affect their bottom lines. We find that the investors themselves are looking at how ecological footprint of the companies affects their business outcomes. and what are the associated business liabilities that come along with this kind of exposure? And that's part of their investment decisions. We find companies, of course, seeking to minimize that exposure. And all of this points to the rising importance of reporting and disclosure. It's no accident that the uh, financial, stability force, uh, financial Stability Board focused its first major report on this question of climate-related financial disclosure. But the risks and liabilities, these new risks and liabilities, they're not limited only to climate change. Yeah? You have all sorts of possible dangers. We have the profligate use and poor management of natural resources that are limited. These could very easily begin to cause disruptions to supply chains. Mm -hmm. We have the unchecked deforestation in some parts of the world that not only affect the global carbon bu budget, they affect watersheds and our ability in, in the future to ensure adequate supplies of potable water. Air pollution kills 7 million people prematurely every year, and we cannot begin to estimate the social and economic cost of those losses. And nobody has any idea yet of how the pollution of our waters, the oceans, the rivers, the, the lakes, how all of that will affect our ability to sustain uh, nutritional food systems, yeah? or how it's going to affect human health and at what cost. And every one of these problems and of that longer list of problems can affect business. It can become a cost factor for business. Every single one of those problems can undermine profitability and affect, uh, adversely affect your markets. And so environmental and sustainability considerations are essential for business, and they are a problem for finance. But we already see change happening. We look at the renewable energy sector where the investments are exploding. Exponentially they're rising from, from day to day, and they're driven by the technology, which has become more accessible and it's more scalable, a predictable policy framework, and by a very clear-eyed assessment of the future of fossil fuels. And that is driving the change, and we're going to see this sort of change happen in different sectors and different industries as technology is deployed and business models change. So as the business case is changing, what was profitable yesterday is going to be less profitable today, and maybe even less so in the future, and that too is an important fact for investors to take into account. The shift in finance may very well be the most important transformation of them all. Uh, and it is a transformation, it is a shift that we see happening with increasing pace. Uh, in particular, over the last two years, we've seen that the whole debate around green and sustainable finance is moving away from policy debate into policy making. It's moving away from innovation into mainstreaming. It's moving away from advocacy towards sharing of experience. Again, we've had examples of that uh, presented this morning. We see the momentum of this change is, is rapidly increasing in both the public and the private sectors. One of the things that we do at UN Environment is act as, as the secretariat of the Green Finance Study Group of the G20. And at their request, we've been monitoring progress against seven key options that the study group identified as facilitating of green finance. We see this progress happening through three mutually reinforcing trends. One, there is increasingly systematic action at the country level on green finance. 
we see broader and deeper international cooperation, not just in the G20, but also in the OECD, the Financial uh, Stability Board, the Sustainable Banking Networks are just examples. We have the increased market leadership and governance, and, and that both at the individual and at the country level, where it's driven in part by the policy signals that are emanating from governments and from the global community, but it's also driven by increasing client demand for green financial products and by technological advances like, like digital finance. Just in the domain of pensions, to give you a few examples of the kinds of changes that have been happening just very recently, the, the UK pension regulator in July of 2016 clarified that um, economic, social and governance factors are material issues, and these material issues need to be taken into account by pension fund trustees. The Canadian um, Association of Pension Supervisory Authorities changed its guidance uh, in February of last year to list ESG issues as, as typical risks that should be evaluated by, by pension trustees. So you can see already that there is quite a bit of regulatory reform happening. Uh, last, no, it was in December 2016, uh, we were invited to participate in the launch of the Sustainable Insurance Forum, which is a, a loose amalgamation of insurance regulators from around the world who've come together to see how they should change the way they regulate their industry to keep pace with and to frame the changes that are happening in the private insurance industry as a result of, of these considerations of sustainability. But there's a lot that needs to be done in the financial uh, field. Um, we need to mobilize much longer term financial flows because the types of investments that we're talking about are not the short term three month investments. These are fundamental investments in infrastructure that need uh, a longer term to maturity. We need to find longer term instruments that will allow us to mobilize large amounts of money at scale, but also to transfer and to translate these large amounts of money into the financing for smaller scale retail investment projects, which may not be uh, all huge and massive, but we do also need to put up a pipeline of bankable projects at scale into which sustainable finance can flow over time. And there are other questions that we have to answer for us to make progress towards a sustainable financial system. First, what is the role of public finance? How does public finance uh, get used effectively to leverage private capital and how to de-risk the political and regulatory uncertainty that hold back private investment? How can transparency about climate and sustainability-related risks be improved? Because this is a really important prerequisite for the kind of reporting and the routine integration of corporate sustainability performance into investment decisions. What kind of regulatory action in the real sectors of the economy, that is on the demand side of finance, do we need in order to drive uh, this demand for green finance? And what kind of regulatory changes do we need on the supply side of finance to make these these uh, resources more available in time? And how can we accelerate this greening of the financial markets? How can we in encourage individual people as savers, but also as shareholders of financial institutions, to demand that their financial institutions take this sustainability agenda seriously and provide the resources that we need to invest in sustainable projects? And how can we make sure that actors on financial markets make climate and sustainability considerations an essential part, a routine part of their business models, of the kinds of questions they ask themselves as they make capital allocation decisions. I'd like to wind down uh, by referring to CalPERS itself. Um, I, I think Ted and Anne made very clear that the sustainability agenda was part of the motivating factor behind some of the work that you've been doing now uh, and with your sustainable investment activities. Um, we think that the sustainable development goals, the agenda itself, can be very relevant to institutional investors like CalPERS because on the one hand it offers a, a high level model, a sort of a, a narrative for framing some of the types of interventions and the types of investment decisions that you'll be making over time that puts it into a context of, of, a, of a, a common approach to the future of, of financial markets. These uh, goals, because they influence government policy, will also help to shape the environment for investment through this policy impact. And by doing so, they also help to shape the investment opportunities that you'll find as you look forward. <coughs> They'll help to develop or to encourage the development of standardized reporting, which will, again, facilitate the investment decisions that you and similar 
um, investment institutions will be taking. They will change, they will have a material impact on longer term risk and on the returns of investment. But the way in which CalPERS is also changing its own approach is of great importance as well to this whole process of accelerating reform and transformation of financial systems. Right now, risk is usually think, thought of in terms of volatility, market volatility and tracking error. But your own approach, your investment beliefs have stated clearly that risk is multifaceted and it's not being entirely captured by the typical metrics that we have. And the work you're doing there to deal with risk is pretty revolutionary and it also is, is, is setting a standard that others will follow. And it's really important to see that this kind of analysis of risk is happening here on your own um, initiative for reasons that are intrinsic to your mandate, not because the UN says so, but because you have to. And you've already, through the Sustainable Investment Strategic Plan, expanded the range of risks that you consider to be material. You have climate change in there, you have demographic trends in there. I think that's all very, very important. But it also raises the question of what other kinds of risks need to be taken into account as material for uh, sustainable, for um, investment decisions. And what kinds of metrics and methodologies do we need to assess those risks? And can we build the sorts of frameworks of risk assessments and measurement that we need building on what already exists? I know that there is, for example, the global real estate framework. Is that something that could be used as a way of approaching a more comprehensive assessment of the risk of sustainable infrastructure, for example? Maybe that's a way to accelerate progress towards uh, some of these new ways of modeling and managing risk. And there'll be other areas where I think the leadership of an institution like CalPERS will be very important. Uh, we had a lot of discussion this morning about um, ESG factors, yeah? e um, environmental, social, and governance issues. I think it's becoming increasingly clear through research that these are drivers of long-term investment value. They are. And the question then comes, should they, could they, must they be gradually integrated into the concept of fiduciary duty? Yeah. Because if these are factors that affect macroeconomic fundamentals, which they do, research proves that, then these factors will too affect the return on any given investment. And this might well need to be taken into account at the outset. Yeah. We also uh, know that the way in which you act and deal with these, with the integration of ESG factors in your own investment decisions can also help to clarify the role of active ownership or the role of engagement in public policy uh, formulation and whether that is an appropriate form of, of meeting your fiduciary duty or not. And in many respects, the debates around ESG uh, issues do tend to better identify the financial materiality of some of these, is, uh, these issues and help investors to decide where they need to focus their attention. There are a couple of questions though, that I'd like uh, the board to consider. I hope we have a chance to talk about them a little bit in the, in the debate uh, that comes. Um, does this framework of sustainable development goals, does that change your approach, should it change your approach to defining, managing, and measuring risk? And to what extent should some of the broader social or, or ecological considerations that underpin this framework feature into this kind of decision making alongside, of course, your, your examination of financial returns? What role can we in the UN play in helping you to identify some of these investment opportunities? And um, can we help you define the sustainability of investment opportunities in, way that is, in ways that are useful to you? Um, do you see any way in which you can approach your investment decisions taking a whole of the SDG approach? Or do you need to look at individual SDGs as more useful for making investment decisions? And what would you say would be the most useful way in which the short-term orientation of financial markets could be mitigated to allow for the mobilization of the longer-term resources we're going to need for the kinds of investments that we have to do? There's a lot that you can do also to help us. Um, I, I talked about what the role of the UN should be um, in, this, uh, in this new agenda. We need to understand and, and to be able to measure the flow of finance into sustainability. And we need to uh, understand the drivers of these investment decisions. And this kind of dialogue that we're having here with you today and hopefully will have in increasing uh, frequency in the future will help us to understand these drivers better. It'll help us to 
develop the kinds of partnerships that we need to have, because as I said, this agenda will not take place unless it is through partnerships. And we need to understand how we can best demonstrate the value to the private investor, to the private company, of this sustainable development agenda. You know, what is it about this agenda that is materially interesting to you and that assists you in doing your job? When we get to that kind of understanding and when we can foster these kinds of partnerships, that is when we will be starting to realize the, the rich opportunities that this new agenda presents. Because it's not only about risk, it is indeed about opportunity. You've done a tremendous amount already, and we think you can do more. Uh, you can use your leadership, your size, your credibility to drive an awareness raising, as you have done with the Climate 100. And I think the more you do that, the more you will mainstream some of these sustainability considerations into the decision making of financial institutions and the private sector more generally. And I think I speak on behalf not only of my own institution, the UN Environment, but also the entire UN system in saying that we really are looking forward to continuing and deepening this collaboration going forward for our shared agenda. Thank you very much. Ms. Mather, this, did we have Thank set aside you. this time for Q&A? Yes, I think we do have some questions. Mr. Lind and then Ms. Taylor. Uh, first, I want to thank you very much for being here and for giving us a presentation that I think really highlights the importance of the work that CalPERS does in this area. And it shows that we're not, we're not outliers, we are leaders. And you've kind of shown how we fit in with the overall question about this and, and, and within the overall scheme of it. I, I do have a question and you, you made a very slight reference to it, but um, you know the sustainable development goals, clearly many of them are not, shall we say, fully embraced by the current regime in Washington. So how are we dealing with that challenge and what can we all do to work together in the short term to make sure that we continue to make progress? I think um, my response to that question, which is a politically charged one, <laughs> is that the decisions are made at all sorts of different levels. And actions, however, happen on the ground. Yeah? Now, what we have found is increasingly that mayors and governors, in, in the US context, mayors and governors, but business leaders as well, and even communities and municipalities are saying, well, these aspects of, of sustainability are important for us, for the policies that we do. And I think what is really important is that we focus here on what these different agenda items can do to contribute to improving lives and improving prosperity in a sustainable way. I think the, the large scale national policy debate has its own dynamic, but that need not necessarily prevent us from making progress on the ground in some of these sustainability considerations because there is a good reason why people are interested in that. And we do find that they are continuing to, to follow along those paths. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Sure, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and I read through the entire presentation. Oh. Teresa, we can't hear you. Sorry about that, let me move it over here. I read through the entire presentation last night as well, but I really enjoyed what you were specifically saying, and I thought it was interesting that you kind of asked us some questions about how we can further mm. our work here, but also talked about uh, whether or not we should be including this in fiduciary uh, 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 out, you know, outlines for our duties and stuff. You talked about England, I wrote it here, uh, having redefined it. I thought our labor department also uh, redefined it at one point. I'm sure that's changed by now. Does the UN have a document that redefines our fiduciary duty or, or con in context given the investor framework because I don't know if you heard earlier, we have, we do have folks that are more cons very concerned, and we have every right to be very concerned about our funding status, and thinking that a lot of this is um, uh, stuff that we shouldn't be looking at. But because of the risks that you're naming, uh, and that we have identified as well as as CalPERS, I would like to s see if we have a way of of either using some sort of press to get out that our fiduciary duty this is for the long term, and then whether or not the UN has any kind of document that talks to investors about fiduciary duties. Thank you, it's a very good question. Um, we do, 
it's not a, a document that tries to define fiduciary duty on behalf of a jurisdiction because, of course, there are different jurisdictions with different interpretations of that. But what we have done is a, a comparative analysis of how fiduciary duty is looked upon and how it has evolved in several different jurisdictions. Um, I can give you the reference in a moment when we get offline. But what it does show is that there is this evolving consensus that you know the, the issue of fiduciary duty can be broadened to take into account some of these, what we would previously have called ESG factors. And the reason being that they are recognized as factors that drive the value of investments over, over the longer term. And so consequently, taking them into account in the investment decision does correspond to the fiduciary duty of an investor, or of an in institutional investor in particular, because it is anticipating some of the factors that might inf influence the value of those investments over time. Now, not every jurisdiction is doing it the same way, of course, and of, there is a lot of debate around how far it should go or how, how fast these concepts should change. But there is a lot of reflection going on about it um, as people become aware of the very different nature of risks that are confronting some investment decisions going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other board members? Ms. Yee. Uh, Ms. Yee and then Ms. Hollander. Oh, m sorry, Ms. Hollander and then Ms. Yee. <laughs> Can you turn your microphone on? Is it on? On, oh. but I think ours doesn't. Oh, oh okay. Okay. there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you asked the question, uh, does it change our goals in defining risk? I think the answer to that is absolutely, because now um, we have to make sure that the risk we're underwriting is the risk we're taking. And I know we had talked uh, kind of offline um, are we collaborating with the insurance industry in order to get a more comprehensive uh, uh, framework of underwriting risk? I think there is a, a certain degree of collaboration that already exists that is being deepened now in many um, aspects of, of, the, of the assessment of climate-related risk the insurance industry is perhaps somewhat ahead of the rest of the financial industry, large right. part because yeah, they're the ones who have to pay when uh, stuff happens. Right. Um, and um, the insurance industry contributed, I think, quite substantially to this uh, report. But doesn't the that task validate those risks because the fact that we're pricing them in, into product? I'm not sure if I understand what you mean by, by validate the risk. I think it is a, an effort to try to assess the risk and to try to build it into the business model. Right. Now, of course, there are risks that we haven't yet entirely assessed. We don't entirely know how we would price them, for example. Right. The, the risk of a loss of biodiversity. We've seen reports of uh, a disappearance of 75% of the bees in parts of Europe. And the, the risk that that poses to our food supply chain Th those risks are immense, but they have not been quantified and certainly haven't been built into any kind of a financial model. And I think that is one of the, the major concerns that we have right now, which is that we are seeing risks emerging that become material risks from all sorts of different aspects of unsustainability. And these risks are not quantified and are not part of the way in which we, we manage our, our financial affairs. That said, on the other hand, um, there are all sorts of opportunities as well that exist out there from a greater sustainability in the way we do our business, that they too have not yet been quantified. And so we may have investment opportunities that are sitting there waiting to be discovered that we haven't yet discovered because we're not looking at them in the right terms. So I do think that there's a lot that can be learned from the insurance industry, but the insurance industry as well also has a lot that they can learn from banks or from stock exchanges, for example. And, and I think the, the key point is to get this dialogue going around where the risks might lie and what the opportunities actually are uh, from sustainability. Ms. Yee. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Secretary General, um, for being here. And I really have um, looked forward to this discussion for a very long time mm -hmm. and really do see value with respect to the SDGs. Um, I mean, in my mind, it's really you know kind of not a either or proposition about whether we embrace these uh, in, in substitution for anything else that we're considering, but it really is, um, you know, inclusive of uh, what we already are uh, exploring relative to our own, um, our own uh, strategic plan. Uh, I have a couple questions. The report um, indicates that you have, uh, well, actually uh, presents indicators for each of the 17 SDGs, and 
Um, obviously, data and metrics matter uh, a, a great deal, and uh, the quality of the data is uh, important as well. Are you uh, are you anticipating any metric changes within the next few years? And I guess what I'm asking is, um, is this going to be a moving target? And if we're going to actually try to incorporate uh, some of these goals, um, what is the formal process for looking at these indicators uh, if they should change over time? Yes, indeed. Um, th this is a moving target. Um, we have 169 targets underpinning all of these 17 goals. And we have a, a really large effort underway to define the indicators that will help us to measure progress. Now, again, these are not indicators in the financial sense of the word, but they are indicators of the progress towards the sustainability. And we hope that they can be taken into account by financial decision makers as they make their investment decisions. We have a series of indicators which we call tier one indicators that have already been agreed. These are things that most governments and most uh, societies already are, are collecting. We have a series of tier two indicators which are close to full agreement, but the, um, the, the obstacle right now is trying to get everyone to buy into the definitions and to gear up to be collecting the data and presenting the analysis in the appropriate way. Then we have tier three indicators which are much more specific and detailed indicators that may not be applicable across the entire world, but are useful in certain contexts for more, de more information about particular aspects of a, a given issue. Now, when we look at the, uh, the, the process that we have in place, we have what we call an, an interagency and consultative group. We have all of the agencies of the UN system, but we also have a group of experts that come from academics, that come from industry, that come from uh, even to some extent the financial sector, who help us to identify what is the important information that we need to have so that we can make sure that we're not missing anything that's really critical for us to be able to make proper decisions. That said, um, I'll refer now to a, t a totally different type of, of indicator that we've seen a lot of interest in, which is a composite indicator that will allow us to assess the sustainability of a given investment. You know? now, now, that's a huge challenge when you think about it, because on the one hand, you have the financial return that you need to look at, and I think we know pretty well how to measure that. But we also know that different types of investments have different types of impacts across various domains, and bringing those impacts into an overall assessment of that in particular investment, that is, is, is quite a job. And frankly speaking, I don't think we have done a good job of coming up with any kind of composite indicator in the UN. We know that there are other uh, entities, other institutions that are thinking about that, including institutions in the financial sector, but there isn't any one definition of what is fully sustainable, nor any one index that can be used to assess the sustainability of an, in of an investment project. And that, I think, is a big challenge for all of us as we go forward. The, the closer we get to standardized reporting and standardized disclosure, the easier it will be for investors to make their choices. Now, we have different definitions of what is green. What is green in China may be, what may be different to what is green in Luxembourg, for example. But at some point, it will become useful to have a, a comfortable understanding of what green means to avoid any, any sort of misapprehension or any kind of, of mistake in, in making the investment decisions. And one last thing I'd like to throw out. As we have a sustainable development agenda that takes into account some of these intangibles, like inequality or, or human health, well, it's not intangible, of course you can measure that, but things that are not purely economic in their, in their scope, it does mean that we have to, as a human society, move beyond GDP as a measure of progress. GDP measures the value of goods and services that produce. It doesn't measure the quality of those goods and services. It doesn't measure the contribution of those goods and services to that sustainability agenda in any of its facets. And there's a lot of work going on now in that regard. We, we've, heard, we've heard about happiness indices and you know, interrogations of which societies are, are the most content. And all of that is important for, for policy making. It's important for investment decisions. But none of that is properly measured yet, or at least not in a standardized way. And as we make progress toward sustainability, these considerations become even more important, and they will start feeding their way back into the decision making in the, in the financial and the business sector as well. So yes, it's a moving target. <laughs> Can I Thank you. ask one last question sure. um, to Ted and to Anne? Um, so given this discussion about SDGs, um, and I'm sure you're going to talk about this, but I'm kind of jumping ahead in terms of next steps. So is the next step then to 
I guess, overlay these on our plan to see where there are places where we can inform each other um, between CalPERS and the UN. Um, I mean, I do see some, or, or is it, uh, and I hope this isn't the case, where uh, we're going to go back and try to figure out how we might want to even back it up further and incorporate these in our investment beliefs, because I do think they're kind of, uh, I, I mean, we're at that point now where I think we, we're doing this work, and, and um, that w what, what do you see are kind of the next natural next steps if this is going to be uh, one uh, aspect of how we can uh, begin to be better informed about uh, incorporating sustainability into our investment decisions? Sure. Yeah, you're right. You are jumping a little bit ahead, okay. uh, but uh, that's always good. We do have a, a time set aside for next steps at the end of the next presentation uh, from PRI. Uh, and the reason we sequenced it that way is PRI really is a body of investors that is, are wrestling with and considering how to uh, approach and how to use and integrate the SDGs into um, into their investment decision making. So I think it's probably good to use that sequencing, uh, hear from PRI what uh, their perspective is and what other investors are doing. And then during the next steps, I think you're asking the exact right questions and that'll be our discussion. How, how do we go about doing that? The short answer I think is we plan to have a discussion in March uh, with the committee after having a chance to reflect on these, um, these topics today as well as perhaps having a um, panel uh, in July of other investors uh, in addition to CalPERS and, and talk to them about how different investors are viewing this uh, differently uh, to, again, give perspective uh, to, uh, to the board and to ourselves how, how, how we might go forward. Thank you. Mr. Costigan. Hey, Madam President, uh, Assistant Secretary General Harris, thank you for being here. It's very informative, and I appreciate uh, some of the comments that we had this morning at breakfast that you raised. Uh, just a couple points, and more of an observation and then some long-term questions. First, on the fiduciary obligation, the difficulties, at least, that I've had, um, and you raised it as it related to the health issues, is we have to separate the two, and, and, and I'll get this to my second part as it related to tobacco, is that the first part of investments really relates to, as Mr. Darby said, talked about the returns of the fiduciary obligation to the, the payment of the benefits. And, and then the second now is this consideration of both climate change and these 17 other, or these 17 items that are outlined as it relates <coughs> to overall risk to the portfolio. The problem is it's almost a damned if you do, damned if you don't. As a fiduciary, if I focus too much on this, I risk lower returns, which opens me to fiduciary. The issues you've raised now talk about inaction raises the risk of a fiduciary breach. So a, as, as a trustee, I'm sort of stuck in the middle. Um, and I think as I mentioned to you, we often refer to, at least I do refer to this as the Monday-Tuesday dilemma. Monday's investment committee, Tuesday's health committee, you wear two separate hats. The reason I, this sort of this long-winded, I know we're late is I was a no vote on tobacco reinvestment, but it wasn't related to the health issues of tobacco. <coughs> when I cast my vote not to reinvest in tobacco, it was because tobacco is a highly regulated, highly taxed, global asset. I mean, all countries look to it as a revenue source. All countries look to it as a potential health risk, and therefore they regulate it. What I don't see in these 17 or even the context of climate change right now is if you remove the health element, because this is as a fiduciary, okay, I'm not supposed to take into health considerations, and I'm using tobacco as the model because we have a model to look to. What do you see as the long-term forecast that relates to climate change? Are we going back to our climate 100? I'm sorry. Are we looking at a heavily taxed, heavily regulated asset that gives you a different <coughs> position as a fiduciary that's not related to health? Did you follow the way we looked at tobacco? Tobacco is taxed. It's regulated. It's limited as to who can purchase it, right? So I don't have to get to the aspect of health as it relates to tobacco because long-term, I believe, tobacco goes away and uh, ends up in a black market concept because on the open market, it's either taxed or regulated. So where do you see these 17 fitting in as a fiduciary? And, and I know that's a probably much longer than the two minutes we're going to have. <laughs> but, and certainly would hope you come back in the papers that you talked about because this is, as a California fiduciary, I'm not faced with Luxembourg or, or Greece or the others. I have to adhere to what our state statutes say as a fiduciary that, it, that poses potential personal liability, not institutional liability, but personal liability to me on the votes that I cast. 
I I'm going to be a, a little bit sort of undiplomatic here. <laughs> um, because you are an investor that has to look at the long, t I mean the really long term, yeah? You also, I think, are confronted by trends of change that might not affect a shorter term investor. Now, I can't sit here and tell you at what date and at what time the last coal-fired power plant is going to be shut down, but I can sit here and tell you that that is going to happen. It's inevitable. It doesn't matter what the politicians think about it. That's a salient fact for you in your decision-making because an investment in a particular enterprise that has, let's say, a large exposure to coal-fired energy, that investment is going to lose value over time. As I say, I can't tell you at what point in time it's going to lose 10% and when it's going to be totally valueless, but it's heading in that direction. And the point about these goals, because they're universal and because mm -hmm. governments have committed to them and private industry and civil society stakeholders and, 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 they are relatively predictable in terms of the kinds of change that they are going to presage. With the climate agenda, with the Paris Agreement, it's the same thing. I mean, we know that the human society has to move away from carbon-based energy gen generation, whether we like it or not. Well, and uh, and so the question here is, does that have to be taken into account even before it turns into a financial return or an impact on your financial return? Are you, are you empowered to think about the trend of development <coughs> in market value? And, and you actually just helped make the point I sought to make mm -hmm. is the reason that we know a coal-fired plant's days are numbered is because there is a regulatory and a statutory environment for it to go away. And that's a distinction as a fiduciary when I can look to a policy. I, 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 all I'm trying to point out is the difference between aspirational goals and, and, and goals that relate to and as a fiduciary. It's something that we take very important on it. And again, like on tobacco, reasonable minds can disagree. I mean, that, and, we, and we can't lose that, that if there are folks that disagree, and again, back to tobacco, that doesn't mean one side's right or one side's wrong, it's as long as the information is there. And so I certainly look forward, Madam President, to future discussions on this, particularly as the, the United Nations and others look to how do we address the judiciary, how do we address the six, get very quickly, back to your point, you're exactly right, with apartheid, 50 years ago, we wouldn't have known, yet this board and others operated to in a changing environment. What is important today, we will not know in, in 50 years, but what we do know with certainty is that there are members sitting in this room and listening that will actually be here in 50 years who are expecting a payment that we have got to ensure. So thank you, Madam President. Thank, thank you, Mr. You. Harris. Thank you very much. I, I would just note that the UN, that the PRI, uh, Principles for Responsible Investment, has published an investment case related to the SDGs. It's just published a couple of months ago, and it addresses both the macro and micro risks and opportunities associated with the SDGs. So, for example, um, you know, climate change is obviously a, could be a r really crucial risk both to the economy at large, but also to individual investments that we might make. Um, and economic inequalities could also be a drag on long-term economic growth and thereby a drag on our ability to, to ha achieve you know, strong beta returns over the long term. Ted, you probably yes, want that, to add something. Well, that, uh, that document is in, uh, yeah. in the board's materials uh, yeah. from the PRI. The other, the other investment uh, lens that's always Im important to acknowledge as we think through these trends and how they pose risks to the portfolio is at what price? So thinking through uh, thermal coal investments is how much is the price of that company or that uh, asset uh, is priced to reflect those risks or not. And as investors, that's what we're constantly trying to evaluate. Do we have enough information to see these trends? How, are, how is the marketplace pricing uh, the risk of this degradation? Is it pricing it correctly? Is it missing something? Um, and trying to evaluate based on price and future return whether or not these risks will materialize over time. Uh, w I think one of the other pieces that is a good point to underscore in terms of the difference between the context for tobacco and, uh, and for energy is all of that regulatory and um, litigation risk in tobacco really resulted in an in a, a almost monopoly for the tobacco companies, which actually gave it a you know, favorable position in the marketplace from a, a, a market power standpoint, whereas it's the, the opposite in the energy um, 
equation in that there are so many competitors and new competitors to provide energy supply that uh, it's, a, it's a much different equation for investors. So uh, adding on the investor lens to these trends is really the, uh, the whole purpose of having all of the context, both the trends that are coming as well as the investment professionals analysis of, of pricing of these risks is, uh, is really the, the difficult part. Thank you. Okay, well, we are now at 11.15, so we're about 15 minutes behind schedule, but we are going to take a break now, and we'll take a 15-minute break, so we'll come back at 11.30.